will make a start this evening for our, our evening gospel service. And I'm very grateful to have everybody here on a, um, on a very warm uh, Sunday evening. But um, we praise the Lord that we can come, we can meet together in the house of the Lord. And we know that the Lord will, will bless the meeting together of his people. And we're praying that God's presence will be with us. And so as we pray together and we begin our service this evening, I hope you'll pray that God's spirit would speak to you in a very special way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come in this evening, we would bow before thy throne, and we acknowledge that we are thy people and we are the sheep of thy pasture. We want to be led and we want to be those who would follow thee. Teach us to follow thee as we open the precious pages of thy word. We pray that we would see thee high and lifted up. And that our desire would not be for the things of this world, that our desire would not be for human things, but that our desires this evening might be spiritual. That we would desire our God, that we might know thee, that we might know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Conform us, we pray, <coughs> through the praise that is given, through the preaching of the holy word of God. Conform us this evening, we pray, even into the image of thy dear and thy blessed Son. <coughs> we pray that this will be a glad meeting, that it might be filled with joy unspeakable, and that it would be filled with thy glory and with thy presence, and that even all of us could say that we were glad that we were able to enter into the house of the Lord and that we, were, we can rejoice in thy praises, that we can rejoice in thy goodness. Shower thy loving kindness upon thy people, we pray, for we come to thee with open hands and with an open heart. And we come praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take our hymn books together tonight and let's sing together hymn 315. Hymn 315, ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today for a soul returning from the wild. Bells of heaven, there is joy today for a soul returning from the wild. See the Father meets him <coughs> out upon the way, welcoming his weary wandering child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring. Tis the ransomed army, like a mighty sea, healing forth the anthem of the free. Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today, for the wanderer now is reconciled. Yes, a soul is rescued from his sinful way and is born anew a ransom child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring. Is the ransomed army like a mighty sea, pealing forth the anthem of the free? Ring the bells of heaven, spread the feast today. Angels swell the glad triumphant strain. Angels with gladful tidings bear it far away. 
for a precious soul is born again. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring. Tis the ransomed army like a mighty sea. Healing for the anthem of the free. <coughs> well, you may be seated. That's a lovely hymn. You don't really, that hymn is, it comes to us really from what our Savior said after he gave the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, you may remember. He said that there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance. And we pray that even tonight there would be rejoicing in heaven over some sinner that would repent and turn from their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to read together from God's word this evening. I hope you'll take a Bible and you'll turn to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And if you're you're visiting with us this evening, we're very glad that you're here and uh, glad you've chosen to be here on a very warm evening. And we want to take the Bible. We always have a Bible reading together. We want to take and read this evening. If you don't know where the book of Ecclesiastes is, turn to the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle. You'll find the book of Psalms in the middle. And then if you just keep turning back a little little bit more, you'll come to Proverbs. And then you'll eventually come to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to read the 10th chapter. I've actually asked Bliss to come along. He's going to read for us tonight. But you can follow along in God's word as he reads to us tonight. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apocryphy to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly in him that is in, repu- in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. <coughs> yea, also, when he is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place. For yielding pacifieth great offences. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, (coughs) and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow himself up. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? The labor of the foolish weareth every one of them, but he knoweth not how to go to the city. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. By much lothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh <coughs> merry, but muddy answereth all things. Curse not the king, no not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Well, we're grateful for the reading of God's holy word this evening. And we'll be back in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 just in a moment or two, if you hold your place there. But let's sing together another hymn. If you have your hymn book, let's turn again and turn to hymn 393. Hymn 393, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. 
Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, where love and joy and light abound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my constant aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, where love and joy and light abound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Beyond the mist I fain would rise, to rest beneath unclouded skies. Above earth's turmoil, peace is found by those who dwell on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, where love and joy and light abound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I long to scale the utmost height, though rough the way and hard the fight. My song while climbing shall resound. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, where love and joy and light abound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lead me up the mountainside I dare not climb without my guide, and heaven gained I'll gaze around with grateful heart from higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me see faith on heaven's stable land, where love and joy and light abound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Well, you may be seated. And we just want to give you a few notices and uh, just some things that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Again, if you are joining us, if you're visiting with us this evening, we're very thankful that you're able to be with us. We'd encourage you to join us for some of our other services throughout the week as well. Of course, on Tuesday, you can join us. We have a prayer meeting and a Bible study every Tuesday at 6 p.m. And that's held, it's not here in this building, it's held at our other building, just a short distance away from here on Spring Road. And um, we'd, we'd encourage you to come along. You can bring, we bring our prayer requests together and we pray together and then we open the Word of God and have a Bible study. And uh, that's this Tuesday at 6 p.m. And then, of course, our regular Sunday services. We have a Sunday morning service at 11 a.m. And it's held right here. And then, of course, our Sunday night service 
um, as well. And over the next few weeks, there will be a few changes to our normal weekly schedule. We all know this. We have Camp Victory every summer, and lots of preparation goes into it, and there's a few changes to schedule. Uh, one of them is this upcoming Saturday, there will be no youth club uh, because there will be a Camp Victory training day. Then the Saturday after that, there will be a youth activity, but not here. We're going to take all of our young people to a youth activity at Dudley Baptist Church. And so if you're a young person and you normally would come to the youth club um, on a Saturday night, we'd encourage you to come along to that. We'll, we'll work at getting some permission forms out and some other things, and we'll get all the details to your parents in this upcoming week. Um, but that very special youth meeting coming up uh, the Saturday following, that's the 24th of July. And then when we come to the, the we'll come to the two weeks of Camp Victory, and on those Tuesday night prayer meeting and Bible studies, we'll not be holding our prayer meetings there at, um, at Spring Road. Um, that's the 26th of July and then the 2nd of August. Instead, we'll be taking anyone who would like to go. You, we, we're going to take you out to the camp, and you can come and join the evening meetings out there. We'll try to bring a minibus out for both of those weeks, uh, so just be aware of that. Also, registration is now open for the Heritage Bible Conference that's being hosted again at the same place, Crown Hall, where we have Camp Victory. We'll be hosting a Bible conference, um, and um, we'd encourage you to come along for that. It's a Thursday, Friday, and a Saturday, and, um, and there's, some, there's some leaflets there on the back table that will give you some information. There's a website on there you can go to, and you can register your name for that. And then one other thing, we're, uh, we, I just wanted to say a big thanks. I know we mentioned it this morning as well, but a big thanks to everyone who helped with our Camp Victory Bake Sale and others who, um, who volunteered their time. Some other people have given some donations as well. We're very grateful for that. And if there's anyone else who's perhaps interested in a way that you could help with Camp Victory, um, this is something we do every year. We take up some food donations and that helps really with the food. That's the largest part of our budget every year. You can imagine having uh, a couple hundred young people there on the property, plus the workers and feeding them three meals a day. And so um, um, anything you can help with that will help with the bill quite a bit. And so um, what we're doing is we have a list of items. I'll be, I'm gonna put this piece of paper on the back table afterwards. And here are some things, maybe perhaps as you're out doing your weekly shop this week, you could pick up an extra one of these items. You could bring it to the church and um, we'll make sure it gets to Camp Victory. So we need really, um, we need tins of tuna, uh, tins of baked beans, individually packed crisps. You could buy like a multi-pack of crisps, biscuits, and instant hot chocolate. Those are the things that we're kind of taking up. And we go through a lot of those things, you can imagine. And so if you're interested in maybe picking up an extra bit of that, um, every little bit would help uh, for Camp Victory. So we're taking up those donations um, for the months to come. Well, let's continue to pray for one another over these next few weeks. Pray for the young people. We'll try during one of our prayer meetings, either th this week or next week, we'll try to have a, um, a list of all the young people from this church who are signed up to go to camp. I hope you'll pray for them, that God would really speak to them, that God would help them <coughs> in a very special way. And we know that he will. Well, here in a moment, we're going to take up our collection this evening. And we take up a, a collection every week, really. It's a free will offering. That means nobody is required to give. But if the Lord lays it upon your heart, um, we would encourage you to give to the Lord and to really to the, to the, that the church might be able to function and that we can, we can really do the Lord's work in this area and in this community. God has provided for us a church as a church, and we, and we continue to pray and seek him for his provision. So we're going to pray together in just a moment. And um, then after we pray, I'll ask um, Benjamin if he wouldn't mind uh, to take up our collection for us this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come and we bow before thy throne once again. And we do give thanks for all of thy mercies, for all of thy provision, for all of thy help. And we give thanks for the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can know the gospel and that we can preach and proclaim the gospel. We pray that as a church family, that as thy representative here on this earth, that we might continue to be faithful in thy word, <coughs> that we might be continue to be faithfully proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Give us many opportunities. 
here in this area, in the streets, right around this building here, in Acox Green and in our city of Birmingham. Help us to shine as lights in the midst of the darkness, we pray. Provide for us and give unto us, we, fa we pray, Heavenly Father, every good thing and the things that are so needful, we pray, that thy work might carry on. Raise us up laborers, we pray. We give thanks for everyone here who is working and laboring in thy vineyard, but we pray for more. We, we know that the harvest is great and the laborers are too few. And we pray, Heavenly Father, raise up more laborers out of this church, those who would go forth from this place and preach thy word and be involved in teaching others the word of God. Raise up out of our Sunday school young men and young ladies, we pray, who would love the Lord and would follow the Lord and would care to give their lives unto Him. We pray, do a mighty work in our city, we ask. We know there are many lost, there are many deceived, and there are many who go about their days never thinking of the Lord. And we pray that by Thy grace through Thy servants and other Christians as well, give us a great stirring and a great awakening, we ask. Pour out thy spirit upon us, we ask. Send a great reviving work here in this place and in this city. Send it to our nation, we pray. Give us a great reviving in our churches, in those places that still hold to the gospel truth and still hold and teach and preach and proclaim the word of God. We pray for a great harvest amongst them, we pray. We pray for great fruit for our labors, that as the word of God goes out, that it would not return void. And even this week, we pray that we, might, that we might be able to hear and to testify of souls that have been saved and have been brought unto thee. We pray for true conversion. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that even the things that might be given this evening, that thou wouldst take them and bless them and multiply. And we feel as if we have so little <coughs> in our hands, but we pray thou wouldst use it in a mighty way for eternity. Bless those who would give, we pray. Provide for them and care for them. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Well, just before our Bible message together this evening, let's take once again our hymn books and let's turn in them to hymn number 394 there. And you just heard the tune being played and maybe somebody might ask, why do you as Christians, why do you go every single week, every single Sunday and you're always in the same place and you always open the same book? Why? Well, we want to learn more about Jesus. And what a great hymn that emphasizes that. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Let's stand together. More about Jesus would I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. 
Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will discern, Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness more of his love who died for me more about jesus in his word holding communion with my lord hearing his voice in every line making each faithful saying mine more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, more of his love who died for me, <clears throat> more about Jesus on his throne, Riches in glory, all his own. More of his kingdom, sure increase. More of his coming, Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness, more of his love who died for me. Well, you may be seated. And let's take our Bibles together once again and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. We'll look together in God's Word once again as we've been going through this book of the Bible on a Sunday evening. <clears throat> and this great book really that goes through and it tells us about life. And it, and it describes for us, doesn't it? We've gone through chapter by chapter. We're nearly to the end of the book. And it describes for us that life without God... Life under the sun, that phrase that's used over and over again in the book, it's vanity. It's empty and it's meaningless. That's what vanity means, something that's empty and uh, meaningless. You know, without God, imagine if there, if there was no God. Many people who are atheist or who are agnostic, that's, that's either what they believe or what they desire. They wish that there was, there was no God. And I would think, what a... What a terrible way to live, because without God, guess what? Life is meaningless. Life is empty. There's no purpose to anything, really. All, all, all we're left with is what they call nihilism. Nihilism just means it, it's, it, it's a mindset that life is empty and meaningless. There's no point to anything. Why, why try to give your life to a purpose? Why try to inject meaning into any activity, into family or friends or relationships? It's just meaningless. We're all just an accident. We're just a cosmic accident where something exploded and really there, there could have been no life just as easily as there was life. There's no point to it. And we could say about those people, they, they actually agree with Scripture. That if there is no God, that life under the sun, it's vanity. Now we praise God that He does exist and that there is meaning, there is purpose, and there is faith, and there is hope in Him. But without God, life is, uh, 
vanity. It goes a step further. It describes in this book of the Bible, in these, especially these first nine chapters we looked at, that life without God is vexation of spirit. Not only is life empty, it's harmful. That word vexation is harmful. Do you know that everything in life is worse without God? Your home is worse without God in your home. Your marriage is worse without God in your marriage. And we can certainly say, looking at the pages of history, that society is worse without God. But we could add one more to that. When we think about life without God, when we think life under the sun, there's one other word we can add as we come to the 10th chapter of Ecclesiastes, and it's the word foolishness. Life without God is foolishness. It is a foolish way to live your life. And this 10th chapter is a bit different than some of the other chapters. If you were reading along with us, when we came to our Bible reading, it really, it really almost looks out of place in this book of the Bible. This chap chapter 10 really feels like it would be more in place in the book of Proverbs because this chapter deals really with a very similar theme to the book of Proverbs. It contrasts two very opposite things, wisdom and foolishness. And they're compared and they're contrasted. And the obvious conclusion is this, that we must seek after God's wisdom. God has given us wisdom. And we need it because life without God is foolishness. And let's be honest. We as human beings, we are foolish creatures. From the, from the bottom of us to the top of us. From the very lowest person to the very highest person. I mean, think about what's happened in our nation this week. We've had a prime minister resign. Now, we could, we could all go around to give our political opinions. We're not going to do that, by the way. We're here to preach the word of God and not politics. But, um, you know, people could point to a number of things, but many people would say, well, what, why, how, why did the prime minister have to resign? And many people might point to a foolish decision to hold a party during lockdown. And any thinking person would say, that was a bit foolish, wasn't it? And then you tried to cover it up. That was even more foolish. It's the internet age. You can't cover anything up. It was foolish. And we saw a person really really fall from power. Maybe you could point to other things, perhaps. Again, we're not going to get into political discussion. But we, we can see plain and obvious. We're, we're, we're foolish creatures. When left to our own devices, when left to ourselves without God, we're going to be foolish people. And he's not the exception. He's the, he's the rule, isn't he? And in this 10th chapter, we see wisdom and foolishness compared and contrasted. And the truth is, is that if you, if you try to live without God and without His wisdom, and you try to live by your own wits, by your own wisdom, by your own strength of mind and your own intelligence, you know what's going to happen? It's only going to end in disaster. You and I, we need God's wisdom. And I want to speak about that this evening for a few moments. You need God's wisdom. You do. Why do you need God's wisdom? Let's look in the pages of Scripture. It says, this very first verse, what a, what a very fitting description that's given. It says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly to him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. You see, we need God's wisdom because here's what happens. Your own wisdom will eventually begin to stink. And just a little bit of folly, we find in there. Just a little bit of foolishness, just one bad decision. Just one slip of the mind. Just one slip, really, of your mental and, uh, you know, you weren't thinking and you just did something. What does it happen? It causes a lot of problems. It causes a lot of trouble. And here, the, the analogy is given to us of someone who's an apothecary. Maybe today we might call that person a chemist. Or, and they, so they spent, these people, they would spend hours and days making medicines and making ointments and making perfumes and making all sorts of different things. And it was a lot harder back then than it was today. They would have to go and gather the raw materials, certain flowers and certain herbs and different various uh, things that we, they would gather together. And then they might have to distill it to get the oil out of it. And they would work and work so hard. 
And they would, with a careful formula, maybe secret formulas that nobody but themselves knew, they would put together their medicines and they would put together their, their ointments and they would prepare them in a very special way. And then what, would, what, what do we ha see happens here? Just a, a small little fly, a little, a little, just a small little thing would find its way into the, into the, whatever it was they were preparing, the perfume or the ointment. And there it would, as many bugs do when they get into liquid, they would, it would drown and die. And then what would happen? The whole thing would stink. The entire thing would, all the, all the beautiful, lovely precious scents and, and very health-bringing herbs that you put in there. What is it now? It's all worthless. It's, the, whole pat, the whole batch is worthless. And the whole thing, the whole thing stinks. And all of his expert skill, and all of his expert time, it's ruined by a small fly. Isn't that a great analogy of our life? It says here you could live and you could be a very honorable person. Someone that people look up to you and they say, that's a person of character. That's a person you can depend upon. That's a person who seems to do what's right with their life. You're, you're an honorable person. You're a person of good reputation. And you know what can happen. One small act, one small little deed, one small little thing that you've done in foolishness or you've done without thinking, what can it do? It can cause all of it to stink, can't it? And all of a sudden, your reputation's ruined. And your honor, it's in the mud. And your name is in the gutter. It's gone in an instant. And it can happen to anyone. Maybe that's happened to you in your life. You, one small slip, one little thing that you did wrong, and it's ru ruined your reputation, caused great harm. And this is true, our, our wisdom will eventually stink, and it can happen to anyone. Nobody is immune from the small flies. Look at verse number 6. It says, folly is set in great dignity, and the rich in the low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen folly take hold of rulers and these rulers who were once mighty men they've been brought down low to where they're just they're walking that that was an embarrassment for a ruler that he would have to walk anywhere he ought to be on a on a beautiful majestic horse or being pulled by people or being carried in a chariot he was humbled his life was ruined his reputation was destroyed and he says i've seen i've seen servants on the horse instead it doesn't matter who you are young or old rich or poor high or low all it takes sometimes is one small little thing. And you can live your life as carefully as you want. But you know what's going to eventually happen? Eventually a fly is going to get in. Eventually you're going to make a mistake because none of us are perfect. Eventually you're going to make a misstep. Eventually you're going to do something foolish. And that's all it takes. And if you live according to your own wits and you live according to your own wisdom, the fly is eventually going to get in. You see, we, we need God's wisdom because our wisdom will eventually stink. We need God's wisdom, another thing, because our deeds will eventually be repaid. Look at verse number 8. <coughs> he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt with all. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. What is being described here in these, in these few verses, these are all actions that someone might take, and they're not innocent actions. These are, these are actions we would say with ill intent, with evil intent. You're, these are people, they're plotting to do something wrong. It says, he that diggeth a pit. What's he talking about here? In those days, it was common livestock will be taken to common areas to graze. And you, this may be this, this vast, maybe out into a wilderness. And many different farmers and many different owners would all have their livestock all in the same area grazing on the same land. And, and people who, this is what people who were, 
who are very mischievous would often do. They might go in the middle of the night and they would go and they would dig a pit. They might dig a hole just big enough for a little lamb or a sheep to fall into it. And they would, they would hide it or disguise it in such a way where the sheep couldn't really see it or didn't really understand the danger. And they would fall down into the pit and die. And here's what the person would do. He would wait for some animal to fall into the pit. And he would go and collect the dead animal and he would sell the meat. And this was a common enough thing. It's referred to, in fact, in the Old Testament law of Moses, there's specific things mentioned about this particular act. It was such a common thing that people would do. And they would dig a hole, and then when some animal fell into it, and if they got caught, they would just say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I was trying to dig a well. I'm sorry, I didn't mean for it to happen. But they knew exactly what they were doing. He says, if, the, if, if, you, if you're that way, and you're someone who plots, and you plan, if, if you're going to dig a pit, he said, what's going to happen to the person that digs the pit? They're going to fall into it themselves. He goes on, he says, he that breaketh a hedge... Again, this is, something, this is something done in ill intent where someone would take you. We, this is very common in fields today, isn't it? We see hedges all around a field and that it marks a boundary. And, and what someone might do is they would go and they might break a hole in the hedge. And then they could go at night and maybe, maybe steal some of the crop. If there's a crop growing. Or they could, they could leave a hole in the hedge so maybe your livestock, your sheep and your goats and other animals that you might have might wander through the hedge and onto your property. Now they're yours. And he says, if you, if you live your life that way and you're a plotting person, here's what's going to happen. Eventually, if you break down enough hedges, a serpent's going to bite you. We don't have too many serpents in this part of the world, but in the Middle East, they sure do. And they hid in places like hedges. If you break down enough hedges, you're going to get bit. It says, he that goes on, it says, he that whoso removeth stones shall be hurt with this. What is this speaking about? These were boundary stones. They didn't have, maybe in those days, you had, the way you would mark out your boundary, you might have a hedge or what was even more common is you would set up very large stones. Maybe some of these stones were as tall as a man. And you would mark them at certain intervals. And this marked, this was your property. This was the edge of your property. We might put up a fence today. They would very often put stones up. And again, someone in the middle of the night might come and they would move the stones. Maybe just a little bit at a time, but they might take them. This was particularly a problem to people who were widows. And they, they had no way of really uh, having any defense against it. And people would come at night and they would slowly move their stones. Maybe a foot at a time they would move and they would make that person's property smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, he's saying if you, if you, if you move enough stones, one of these days one of them is going to fall on you. And then he says one other thing, he that cleaveth wood, the person that's chopping down trees, Again, a common evil act people would do is they would go onto other people's property. Trees were quite square, scarce in that part of the world. They were very precious if you had a forest or if you had a wood on your property. And so you're not going to cut down your own trees. So again, people would go at night and they go cut down their neighbor's trees and they drag the wood off in the middle of the night. And he says, here's what's going to happen if you cut, if you cleave enough wood, one of those trees is going to fall on you. You're going to be harmed thereby. What is the point of these two verses? They're to remind us that the things that we do in secret, the things that we do with sinful intention. You say, I never done anything that way. Oh, don't, don't, let's not be innocent with one another. We all know what's in our hearts. We all know the things that we plan and we plot and we intend to do. And here's what happens. The things that, do, that are done in secret and the things that are done with sinful intention and the things that are done with great planning and great plotting and great earthly wisdom, eventually you'll have to pay. Eventually it will come back to you. We, people, you know, um, people use the term that the chickens will eventually come home to roost, won't they? God sees it. And the scripture is very plain, isn't it? Be sure your sin will find you out. And that's why we do not live according to the wisdom of our flesh. Because if we're left to the wisdom of our flesh, we all become plotters. And we all become planners. 
And we all become those who decide, uh, let's see how I can take a little bit from my neighbor and get a little for myself. Let's see if I can move the stones a little bit at a time. Make a little hole in his hedge and see what comes through. We cannot live according to our fleshly wisdom. It is full of wicked devices. And we need God's wisdom. Something else, and I think this one is perhaps common to all of us. We need God's wisdom because our words will eventually get around. Look at verse number 12 in the scripture. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. The fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell? So something interesting. Here's what will happen to the lips of a fool. The lips of a fool, eventually, they'll swallow themselves up. Your words will eventually swallow you up. And here's what you and I think. We think in our fleshly minds, here's what we think. We think that we are smart enough and we're clever enough that we can use our words to build ourselves up and to tear others down. And we think, I, I, I'm smart enough. I can, I, can, I can come up with a good story. I can, I can tilt and spin things my way. And I can use my words to my advantage. We just covered this on Tuesday night, didn't we? We were looking through the book of James and he talks about the great evil that is in our tongues. And that it's, it's a great fire that does great damage. But something, this word, the word of God tells us that if you use your tongue as a weapon... What's going to happen? It's eventually going to get around. Look at verse number 20. Curse not the king. No, not in thy thought. And curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. What does it say? For a bird in the, of the air shall carry the voice. And that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Now, is that saying that if you, if you say something that the little, you know, the, little, the little pigeon that's outside your window is going to go carry the words? Now, what's he saying? He's saying words, your, what the things that you say have a way of getting around. You ever heard somebody tell this? So you, I think a phrase really that originates from this verse of Scripture, a little birdie told me. I don't think a bird really came up to and told them. They mean someone, a little gossip, or someone that overheard came and told them. And your words will eventually get around, don't they? What you say about others will eventually get around. Have you experienced that before? You've said something about someone else and you didn't think they'd ever find out and they found out about it. And there were consequences because of it. And there was embarrassment and there were, and there were broken relationships and broken friendships because of it. He says that's, that's the word, that, that's foolish speak. And if, you, if we speak foolishly and we speak according to our own flesh, here's what's going to happen. It's eventually going to get around. In our Sunday school right now, we're taking some time and we're learning. I thought this was very interesting. This happened on this week. We're learning about the life of David Brainerd. David Brainerd was enrolled to be a preacher. He was enrolled in what we would call today a Bible college, a seminary. And there he, as, as many people do in, in education settings, he was sitting with some friends, some of his friends one day, and he was having a go at one of his teachers. And he said something, he said, he said, really made a derogatory remark about his teacher. And he thought, well, these are just my mates. Nobody's going to say anything. Nobody's going to tell anything. But there's someone overheard the conversation. And David Brainerd said the, the one of the, the most, perhaps most foolish decision I ever made in my life was to open my mouth and be critical of that person. And the word did get around. And he was brought to face the dean of Yale College. And he was expelled, excluded from the school, and left there in shame. And spent really the next year of his life living in shame because of it. Why? Because our, our words have a way of finding us out. And I think we, if we had the time this evening, anyone who's of any age here tonight, 
we could all go around and if we weren't too embarrassed, we could share our own experiences of how we've been, we've done that. Our word gets around. And all these things that we talk about, how our wisdom, we need God's wisdom because our wisdom will eventually begin to stink. Because our deeds, the things that we plan and plot, they will eventually come back upon us. How our words that we say, they eventually find a way of getting around. All these things highlight, don't they? They highlight, first and foremost, they highlight our need for salvation. The Word of God is a wonderful thing. It's like, it's like a strong telephoto lens. <clears throat> you know, the Word of God first and foremost reveals God. You can imagine a telephoto lens and you could point it up to the sky and you can see the heavens. Just what the Bible does. It reveals to us what we can't see with our human eyes. It reveals to us God and His nature and His character. If you want to know about God, you open the book of Scripture. But you know what the Bible also does? is a strong telephoto lens. You can use it to view faraway objects. You know what else you can use it for? You can use it to view things close up. And you turn the same lens of God's Word, instead of looking up to God, you can turn the same lens of God's Word to yourself. And you know what it does? It shows your shortcomings. If you ever want to find out the shortcomings of anything, Put a macro lens up to it. Look at something up close. And the closer you look at some things, that's when you begin to see the flaws. Isn't it? That's where you get to see what's wrong. And did you know that's what the Word of God does? The Word of God reveals to us what is wrong with us. It reveals to us our sin. And any time... The Bible does this, and particularly in this chapter, what does it reveal to us? It reveals to us that in our own wisdom, we are filled with bad intent. And let's be honest with one another. Let's not pretend otherwise. We've all been guilty of this. It reveals to us our, that our small, foolish deeds do much damage. And that our foolish words do lots of damage when they come around. And what has it done? It's revealing our sin. And you know, any time our sin is revealed in the Word of God, there's a cure that is necessary. The Word of God reveals sin to us very often. And there is a cure. And the Bible's true. You are a sinner. And if we were to be, speak honestly about our lives, we could say, I've made a stinking mess of it. It could have been something nice. But it's a mess. It stinks. The great truth is this, that there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. That Christ is the Savior of sinners. And when Jesus Christ was here on this earth, the people that he ministered to so often were those who had made a mess of their lives. And on many occasions... People came to the Lord and they said, oh, wait a moment, Who are you? why are you helping this person? This person's a publican, this person's a sinner. If you knew what kind of person this person was, you wouldn't be talking to them. You know what Jesus said? He said, look, I, I didn't come. I didn't come for those that were whole. Those that are whole don't need a physician. I came to call sinners to repentance. What a great thing if you're a sinner this evening, if the Word of God's revealed to you, I've made a mess of my life, I've made bad decisions, I've done sinful things, I've had bad intention. The good news is, that makes you a sinner. And Christ is the Savior of sinners. Jesus Christ died for your sin. And he your sin. Maybe you have people in your life who won't forgive you because of what you've done. There's nothing I can do to change that. But I know Christ can forgive you. I know Christ is able to save you and to cleanse you if you will come to him. You see, these things, these foolish things that the word of God reveals to us, they ought to point you to your need to salvation. And if you've never come to Christ and you've never trusted him for your soul's salvation, you should come to him today. See, these things point to a need for salvation. And you know what else? They point... That we need God's true wisdom. And God's true wisdom is available. We can seek out God's wisdom. Can I encourage you, Christian child of God? Would you, would you get into the habit of doing this if you don't already? 
you know, we, we all have certain habits. You have a, do you have a morning routine? I think we all have a morning routine, don't we? Can I, can I encourage you to do this in your morning routine, to start your day every day with the same request from God? Ask God to give you wisdom for the day. I don't know what a day will bring forth. You don't know what a day will bring forth. In fact, it says in here, the foolish person talks like they know what the day is going to bring forth, but they don't have a clue. We need God's wisdom. Would you start every day that way? That's a great way to start the day. That's something any of us can do, isn't it? We don't, but we should. Ask God to give you wisdom for the day. And then, as the Bible so often says in the book of Proverbs, give your heart to know wisdom. Give yourself to God's wisdom. If you're a Christian, I'm going to live according to what God wants for my life. I'm not just going to read about God's wisdom in His Word. I'm going to give myself to it. Give yourself to know God's wisdom. And if we will know God's wisdom, you know what will happen? God can enable us to do what is right. That's a precious thing, isn't it? To do what is right. So oftentimes we, we would like to do what's right and we end up doing what's not right. And we're filled with regrets. We can do what's right. Look at verse number 2. I love this phrase, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. What does that mean? Does it mean like your heart switches to your different side of your body physically? No, it's not what he's speaking about. He says someone who is a wise man, they have the wisdom of God, their hand is to the right. That means they, they are going to do the right thing. And the opposite of that, the, the foolish man's hand is to the left. That's his tendency. He's going to do what's wrong. But with God's wisdom, you can do the right thing. You can live your life making right decisions. That's what wisdom is. It's the, it's the knowledge and the will to make the right decision, to choose what's right. You can make the right decision. That's the opposite of the person of evil intent, to the person who's always plotting when he can dig his next pit, the person who's plotting on how she can break down the next hedge, how they can move the stones a little bit. I say, with God's wisdom, I can, I can do what's right. Look at verse number four. What else can you do with God's wisdom? If the spirit of a ruler rise up against thee, that'd be a terrible thing to happen to any of us, wouldn't it? If someone with power got angry at you, the spirit of a ruler rose up against you. Imagine, if the spirit of a ruler rise against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. Do you know the wis when the wisdom of God is in your life that you're somewhat you can God can give you wisdom to be able to pacify great offenses. What does that mean? The word pacify means to bring peace. You can become a peacemaker. And people can become very angry at you and very upset at you over something. But with God's wisdom, you can be someone who can put that to peace. I, I've seen this over and over again. People who are very much wiser than myself, seen them deal with people that were very upset, very angry, even against them. And to see how God brought peace to the matter and pacified it. That's great. Right. That's the opposite of the foolish tongue, isn't it? God can give us wisdom to pacify great offenses. And then notice this, verse number 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. You know what he's saying here? He said, the wisdom that God gives is able to make you profitable in the Lord's work. He says, so often without God's wisdom, you know what we are? We're like an axe that is dull. I don't know if you've ever tried to cut something with a dull axe, or maybe you've tried to cut something with a dull knife. It's a waste of time, isn't it? And you put in a lot of effort, and you can swing, and you can swing your axe, and you can, get, you can put all your effort and all your weight into it, and you know what? You're just going to end up exhausted and little work being done. But God's wisdom 
When God's wisdom is upon you, you know what it's like? It's like someone took and they sharpened the blade. We were cutting down some trees at Crown Hall, uh, and, um, and uh, someone was able to take, there was a chainsaw, someone was able to take and sharpen the blades on the chainsaw. And it was amazing, the difference. It was amazing. You know, it's, you can, th- that's what happens when God puts His wisdom in someone's life. They're the same person. The same intellect, they didn't suddenly gain 50 points of IQ or 12 years of education experience. No, what's different? God's wisdom is upon them, and the difference is amazing. I, I, I think of so many people in my life that I can see that, how they've yielded themselves, and God has filled them with their wisdom, and they're, and they're such a different, profitable in God's work. They're able to be used of God. And what a difference, what a striking contrast, by the way, to the, the stinking ointment of the apothecary. Something that should have been of great value, but was wasted. And it all, I'm, I'm, I, you imagine the, the pain in the apothecary's eyes as he pour, had to pour out some ointment that should have been sold for great price. Wasted. So many people's lives are that way. They have great potential. Wasted. I don't want to be that way. I want to be profitable in God's work. I want to be a sharpened axe. I want to be someone that God is profitable to direct. And God can say, I, that person is wise. They have God's wisdom. I'm going to direct them into God's work. I'm going to direct them to people who need the Lord. I'm going to direct them into situations where they can be of great use. The great thing, God's wisdom is available. And we need God's wisdom. May we seek the Lord. Perhaps you need to seek the Lord this evening for salvation. And this... This chapter in God's Word has just been a grim reminder of your need for Christ. If that's the case, don't don't turn away from it. Don't say, that was uncomfortable, I'm leaving. No, allow allow that truth to point you to the Savior. And say, I'm going to do something about the stinking ointment. I'm going to do something about my, my, my evil intents and my sin and my evil words. I'm going to bring them to Christ. I'm going to beg His forgiveness. I'm going to trust that He's able to save me and forgive me. Come to Him for salvation. And then ask Him for His wisdom. There is true wisdom available. And we need God's wisdom on a daily basis. Ask Him daily. Don't let a day go by where you don't ask God for His wisdom and for His help. And may we be a church full of people who would give our hearts to God's wisdom. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for Thy Word. We pray that Thou wouldst keep us as Thy people from ever being like this stinking ointment, a wasted potential, a wasted life. Father, give us Thy wisdom. We need it. We confess we are foolish. Our words are so often foolish. Our deeds and our actions are so often foolish. <clears throat> and we could all come this evening and confess of the many times that we've made a mess of things. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for Thy help and forgiveness. And we pray for Thy wisdom. Lead us to be those who would do what is right and will be used and profitable for Thee. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books, and I hope you'll sing with me tonight our closing hymn, hymn 362. (coughs) 362 there in your hymn book. (coughs) Have you any room for Jesus, He who bore your load of sin? As He knocks and asks admission, sinner, will you let Him in? Have you any room for Jesus, He who bore your load of sin? Have
as he knocks and us in mission. Sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now, his word obey. Swing the heart so widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Room for pleasure, room for business. But for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in your heart for which he died. Room for Jesus, King of glory, Hasten now, his word obey. Swing the heart so widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Have you any room for Jesus? As in grace he calls again. To, oh, today is time accepted. Tomorrow you may call in vain. Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now, his word obey. Swing the heart so widely open. Bid him enter while you may. <clears throat> Room and time now give to Jesus. Soon will pass God's day of grace. Soon <coughs> silence and thy Savior's pleading cease. Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now, his word obey. Swing the heart so widely open. Bid him into while you may. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer this evening. And if God has dealt or touched your heart about something and you'd like to speak to someone this evening, uh, please feel free to speak to me after the meeting. I'll be happy to speak to you and take God's word with you as well. And we, we pray that the Lord will help us even throughout this week. And may the Lord give us the wisdom that we need day to day. I'd like to ask Mr. Iveson, it's good to have you back with us this evening. Would you mind to close our meeting in a word of prayer tonight? Father, thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm.